Scales of Justice by Niall Marsh Read by Benedict Cumberbatch Nurse Cattle pushed her bicycle to the top of Watts Hill and there paused. Sweating lightly, she looked down on the village of Swevenings. Smoke rose in cosy plumes from one or two chimneys. Roofs cuddled into surrounding greenery. The Chine, a trout stream, meandered through meadow and coppice and slid blamelessly under two bridges. It was a circumspect landscape. Not a faux pas, architectural or horticultural, marred the seemliness of the prospect. Really, Nurse Kettle thought with satisfaction, it is as pretty as a picture and she remembered all the pretty pictures Lady Lacklander had made in irresolute watercolour, some from this very spot. She was reminded, too, of those illustrated maps that one finds in the underground, with houses, trees, and occupational figures amusingly dotted about them. Seen from above like this, Swevenings resembled such a map. Nurse Kettle looked down at the orderly pattern of field, hedge, stream, and land, and fancifully imposed upon it the curling labels and carefully naive figures that are proper to picture maps. From Watts Hill, Watts Lane ran steeply and obliquely into the valley. Between the lane and the chine was contained a hillside divided into three strips, each garnished with trees, gardens, and a house of considerable age. These properties belonged to three of the principal householders of Swevenings. Mr. Danbury Finn, Commander Sice, and Colonel Carteret. Nurse Kettle's map, she reflected, would have a little picture of Mr. Danbury Finn at Jacob's Cottage, surrounded by his cats, and one of Commander Sice at Uplands, shooting off his bow and arrow. Next door, at Hammer Farm, only it wasn't a farm now, but had been much converted, it would show Mrs. Carteret in a garden chair with a cocktail shaker, and Rose Carteret, her stepdaughter, gracefully weeding. Her attention sharpened. There, in point of fact, deep down in the actual landscape was Colonel Carteret himself, a Lilliputian figure moving along his rented stretch of the Chine, east of Bottom Bridge, and followed at a respectful distance by his spaniel skip. His creel was slung over his shoulder and his rod was in his hand. The evening rise, Nurse Kettle reflected, he's after the olden and she added to her imaginary map the picture of an enormous trout lurking near Bottom Bridge. On the far side of the valley, on the private golf course at Nuns Pardon Manor, there would be Mr. George Lacklander, doing a solitary round with a glance, thought the gossip-loving Nurse Kettle, across the valley at Mrs. Carteret. Lacklander's son, Dr. Mark, would be shown with his black bag in his hand, and a stork, perhaps, quaintly flying overhead. And to complete, as it were, the gentry, there would be old Lady Lacklander, big-bottomed, on a sketching stool, and her husband, Sir Harold, on a bed of sickness, alas, in his great room, the roof of which, after the manner of pictorial maps, had been removed to display him. In the map it would be demonstrated how Watts Lane, wandering to the right and bending back again, neatly divided the gentry from what Nurse Kettle called the ordinary folk. To the west lay the Danbury Finn, the Sice, the Carteret, and above all the Lacklander domains. Neatly disposed along the east margin of Watts Lane were five conscientiously preserved thatched cottages, the village shop, and across Monk's Bridge the church and rectory and the boy and donkey. And that was all. No pulls in for Carmen, no oldie bunny shoppies which Nurse Kettle had learned to despise, no spurious half-timbering marred the perfection of Swevenings. Nurse Kettle, bringing her panting friends up to the top of Watts Hill, would point with her little finger at the valley and observe triumphantly, where every prospect pleases, without completing the quotation, because in Swevenings not even man was vile. Nurse Kettle mounted her bicycle and began to coast down Watts Lane. On her left appeared the quick-set hedge of Jacob's Cottage. From the far side came the voice of Mr. Octavius Danbury Finn. Adorable, Mr. Danbury Finn was saying. Queen of delight. Fish! <laughs>
He was answered by the trill of feline voices. Nurse Kettle brought herself to anchor at the gate. Good evening, she said. There was Mr. Danbury Finn in his Elizabethan garden giving supper to his cats. He wore a smoking cap, tasseled, embroidered with beads and falling to pieces. On top of this was perched a pair of ready-made reading glasses, which he now removed and gaily waved at her. Are you a peer? he said. Like some exotic deity mounted on an engine quaintly devised by Inigo Jones. Good evening to you, Nurse Kettle. Pray, what has become of your automobile? She's having a spot of beauty treatment and a minor up. And how's the world treating you, feeding your kitties, I see? The persons of the house, Mr. Finn acquiesced. Now, as you observe, sup. What errand of therapeutic mercy has set you darkling in the saddle? What pain and anguish wring which brow? Well, I've one or two calls, said Nurse Kettle, but the long and the short of me is that I'm on my way to spend the night at the big house, relieving with the old gentleman, you know. She looked across the valley to Nun's Pardon Manor. Ah, yes, said Mr. Finn softly. Dear me, may one inquire, is Sir Harold... He's seventy-five, said Nurse Kettle briskly, and he's very tired. Still, you never know with cardiacs, he may perk up again. There now, gossiping again. <laughs> Talking of gossip, I see the colonel's out for the evening rise. An extraordinary change at once took place in Mr. Finn. His face became suffused with purple, his eyes glittered, and he bared his teeth in a canine grin. A hideous curse upon his sport, he said. It is a dreadful thing to say about a fellow creature, a shocking thing, but I do say advisedly and deliberately that I suspect Colonel Carteret of having recourse to improper practices. I'm sure I do not know to what you refer, said Nurse Kettle. Bread! Whams! said Mr. Finn, spreading his arms. Anything! Tickling, even! I put it as low as that! I'm sure you're mistaken. It is not my habit, Miss Kettle, to mistake the wanton extravagances of infatuated humankind. Look, if you will, at Carteret's associates. Look, if your stomach is strong enough to sustain the experience at Commander Sice. Good gracious me, what has the poor commander done? That man, that intemperate filibuster who divides his leisure between alcohol and the idiotic pursuit of archery, that ward room cupid, my God, murdered the mother of Thomasina Twitchett. Not deliberately, I'm sure. Mr. Finn leant over his garden gate and grasped the handlebars of Nurse Kettle's bicycle. In the cool of the evening, Madame Thorns, for such was her name, was wont to promenade in the bottom meadow. Being great with kit, she presented a considerable target. Sice, flushed no doubt with wine, and flattering himself he cut the devil of a figure, is to be pictured upon his archery lawn. The instrument of destruction, a bow, with the drawing power, I am told, of sixty pounds, is in his grip, and the lust of blood in his heart. He shot an arrow in the air, Mr. Finn concluded, and if you tell me that it fell to earth, he knew not where, I shall flatly refuse to believe you. His target, his deliberate mark, I am persuaded, was my exquisite cat. Thomasina, my fair of furs, I am speaking of your mamma. The cat blinked at Mr. Finn, and so did Nurse Kettle. I must say, she thought, he really is a little laugh, living alone with only those cats. It's not to be wondered at, really. She gave him her brightest professional smile and one of her standard valedictions. Ah, well, she said, letting go her anchorage on the gate. Be good, and if you can't be good, be careful. Care, Mr. Danbury Finn countered with a look of real intemperance in his eye. Killed the cat. Good evening to you, Nurse Kettle. Mr. Finn was a widower, but Commander Sice was a bachelor, he lived next to Mr. Finn in a Georgian house called Uplands. He was looked after by an ex-naval rating and his wife. The greater part of the grounds had been allowed to run to seed, but the kitchen garden was kept up by the married couple and the archery lawn by Commander Sice himself. At one end, in fine weather, stood a target on an easel, and at the other, on summer evenings, from as far away as Nun's Pardon, Commander Sice could be observed in the classic pose, shooting around from his sixty-pound bow. He was reputed to be a fine marksman, and it was noticed that however much his gait might waver, his stance, once he had opened his chest and stretched his bow, was that of a rock.
As Nurse Kettle approached the house, she heard the sound of steps on the gravel, and saw him limping away round the far end, his bow in his hand. Hi, she called out brightly. Good evening, Commander. Sice turned, hesitated for a moment, and then came towards her. He was a fairish, sunburned man who had run to seed. He still reeked of the navy, and, as Nurse Kettle noticed when he drew nearer, of whiskey. His eyes, blue and bewildered, stared into hers. Sorry, he said rapidly. Good evening. I uh, beg your pardon. Dr. Mark, she said, asked me to drop in while I was passing and leave your prescription for you. There we are. The mixture, as before. He took it from her with a darting movement of his hand. Most awfully kind, he said. Frightfully sorry, nothing urgent. No bother at all, Nurse Kettle rejoined. I'm calling in at Hammer. Or perhaps you won't mind my trespassing. There's a footpath down to the right of way, isn't there? Of course, please do. They came out on the archery lawn and upon a surprising and lovely view over the valley of the Chine. What a clear evening, Nurse Kettle exclaimed with pleasure. And how close everything looks. I have been told that once upon a time you hit a mark you didn't bargain for down there. Sice stopped dead. She saw that beads of sweat had formed on the back of his neck. Alcoholic, she thought, flabby. Shame, it must have been a fine man when he looked after himself. Quick, grip! Sice cried out, thumping his fist on the seat of her bicycle. You mean the bloody cat? Well, great grief, it was an accident. I told the perisher. An accident! I like cat! His eyes were misted and his lips trembled. We all make mistakes, said Nurse Kettle comfortably. He pointed to a little gate at the end of the path. Where's the gate and hammer? he said, and added with exquisite awkwardness. I beg your pardon, I'm, I'm very poor company, as you see. Thank you for bringing the stuff. Thank you, thank you. Much obliged for the assistance. Good evening to you. She pushed her bicycle through the gate into the well-tended coppice belonging to Hammer Farm, and in the direction of the Carteret's rose garden, where she could hear the snip of garden secateurs and a woman's voice quietly singing. A man's voice joined in, making a second part of the words, Come away, come away, death, and in sad cypress let me be laid. Nurse Kettle approached a green archway, and as she did so the woman's voice broke off from its song and said, That's my favourite of all. Strange, said the man. Strange, isn't it, in a comedy to make the love song so sad. Don't you think so, Rose? Rose? Darling. Nurse Kettle tinkled her bell, passed through the green archway and looked to her right. She discovered Miss Rose Carteret and Dr. Mark Lacklander gazing into each other's eyes with unmistakable significance. Dr. Lacklander blushed to the roots of his hair and said, Good God! Good heavens, uh, good evening. And Miss Carteret said, Oh, uh, hello, nurse, good evening. She too blushed, but more delicately than Dr. Lacklander. Nurse Kettle said, Good evening, Miss Rose. Good evening, doctor. Hope it's all right, my taking the short cut. Nurse Kettle was a romantic woman and took pleasure in the look of excitement on Dr. Lacklander's face and of shyness on Rose's. Nurse Kettle, Dr. Lacklander said rapidly, like a perfect angel, is going to look after my grandfather tonight. I don't know what we should have done without her. And, by the same token, Nurse Kettle added, I'd better go on my way. They smiled and nodded at her. Well, she thought, if that's not a case, I've never seen young love before. Blow me down flat, but I never guessed. Fancy! When her figure, stoutly clad in her district nurse's uniform, had bobbed its way out of the enclosed garden, Rose Carteret and Mark Lacklander looked at each other and laughed nervously. Mark Lacklander said unsteadily, Darling, don't, Rose said, honestly don't. No? Are you warning me off, Rose? Is it all a dead loss? She made a small, ineloquent gesture, tried to speak and said nothing. Well. Lacklander said. I may as well tell you that I was going to ask you if you'd marry me. I love you very dearly, and I thought we seemed to sort of suit. Was I wrong about that? No, Rose said. Well, then? I can't think of getting engaged much less married. <laughs>
You can see what it's like here. I mean, the domestic setup. You must have seen for yourself how much difference it makes to Daddy my being on tap. His second marriage hasn't been a success. If I left him now, he'd really and truly have nothing to live for. Really, nonsense," Mark said. "I won't be put off, Rose. You shall marry me, and if your father's life here is too unsatisfactory, well, he could come to us. Never, don't you see? He couldn't bear it. He'd feel sort of extraneous. I'm going to talk to him. I shall tell him I want to marry you. No, Mark, darling, no, please." His hand closed momentarily over hers. Then he was on his feet and had taken up the basket of roses. "Good evening, Mrs. Carteret," he said. "We're robbing your garden for my grandmother. You're very much ahead of us at Hammer with your roses." Kitty Carteret had turned in by the green archway and was looking thoughtfully at them. The second Mrs. Carteret did not match her Edwardian name. She did not look like a Kitty. She was so fair that without her makeup she would have seemed bleached. Her figure was well disciplined, and her face had been skillfully drawn up into a beautifully cared-for mask. Her greatest asset was her acquired inscrutability. This, of itself, made a femme fatale of Kitty Carteret. "How nice to see you, Mark," she said. "I thought I heard your voices." She moved up to him, and with her gloved hand took a dark rose from the basket and held it against her mouth. What a smell," she said. "Almost improper. It's so strong. Morris is not in, but he won't be long. Shall we go up?" She led the way to the house. Exotic wafts of something that was not roses drifted in her wake. She kept her torso rigid as she walked and slightly swayed her hips. Very expensive, Mark Lacklander thought, but not entirely exclusive. Why on earth did he marry her? Mrs. Carteret's pin heels tapped along the flagstone path to a group of garden furniture heaped with cushions. A tray with a decanter and brandy glasses was set out on the white iron table. She let herself down on a swinging seat, put up her feet, and arranged herself for Mark to look at. Poorest Rose," she said, glancing at her stepdaughter. "You're wearing such suitable gloves. Do cope with your scratchy namesakes for Mark. A box, perhaps." Please don't bother," Mark said. "I'll take them as they are. We can't allow that," Mrs. Carteret murmured. "You doctors mustn't scratch your lovely hands, you know." Colonel Carteret emerged from a spinney halfway down the hill, followed by his spaniel Skip, an old, obedient dog. When he saw the group by the lawn, he lifted his hand in greeting. Mark went down to meet him. "Good evening, Mark," he called. "My dear chap, what do you think?" I've damn near bagged the olden. No, Mark shouted with appropriate enthusiasm. I assure you, the olden below the bridge in his usual lurk. You know, I could see him. And as he panted up the hill, the colonel completed his classic tale of a magnificent strike, a Homeric struggle, and a broken cast. The olden was famous in Swevenings, a trout of magnitude and cunning, the despair and desire of every rod in the district. So I lost him," the colonel ended, opening his eyes very wide. "What a thing! By Jove, if I'd got him, I really believe old Finn would have murdered me. The chap's impossible, you know. How's your grandfather?" Mark said. "He's failing pretty rapidly, I'm afraid. It's on his account that I'm here, sir." And he delivered his message. "I'll come at once," the colonel said. Sir Harold Lacklander watched Nurse Kettle as she moved about his room. He knew that he was dying. His grandson had not told him in so many words, but he had read the fact of death in the boy's face and in the behaviour of his own wife and son. Long time, he said. He used as few words as possible because, with every one he uttered, it was as if he squandered a measure of his dwindling capital. Nurse Kettle placed herself where he could see her. And hear her easily, and said, "Doctor Mark says the Colonel will be here quite soon. He's been fishing. Luck, I don't know. He'll tell you." Holden, ah," said Nurse Kettle comfortably. "They won't catch him in a hurry." The wraith of a chuckle drifted up from the bed, and was followed by an anxious sigh. <laughs>
She looked closely at the face that seemed during that day to have receded from its own bones. All right, she asked. The lackluster eyes searched hers. Papers? the voice asked. I found them just where you said. They're on the table over there. Here. If it makes you feel more comfortable. She moved into the shadows at the far end of the great room and returned carrying a package tied and sealed, which she put on his bedside table. Memoirs, he whispered. The door opened, and Mark Lacklander came into the room followed by Colonel Carteret. Here's the Colonel, Grandfather. Hello, Carteret, said Sir Harold so loudly and clearly that Nurse Kettle made a little exclamation. Nice of you to come. Hello, sir, said the Colonel. Sorry you're feeling so cheap. Mark says you want to see me. Yes, the eyes turned towards the bedside table. Those things, he said. Take them, will you? Now. They're the memoirs, Mark said. Do you want me to read them? Carteret asked, stooping over the bed. If you will. There was a pause. Mark put the package into Colonel Carteret's hands. The old man's eyes watched in what seemed to be an agony of interest. I think, Mark said, that Grandfather hopes you will edit the memoirs, sir. I'll, uh, of course, I'll be delighted, if you think you can trust me. Trust you, implicitly, implicitly. One other thing, do you mind, Mark? Of course not, Grandfather. Nurse, shall we have a word? Nurse Kettle followed Mark out of the room. They stood together on a dark landing at the head of a wide stairway. In the hall below, a door opened and light flooded up the stairs. Mark looked over the banister and saw the enormously broad figure of his grandmother. She began heavily to ascend. He could hear her laboured breathing. Steady does it, Gar, he said. Lady Lacklander paused and looked up. <gasps> ha, she said. It's the doctor, is it? Mark grinned at the sardonic overtone. She arrived on the landing. The train of her old velvet dinner dress followed her, and the diamonds, which every evening she absent-mindedly stuck about her enormous bosom, burned and winked as it rose and fell. <gasps> Good evening, Kettle, she panted. Good of you to come and help my poor old boy. Why are you both closeted together out here? The colonel's here, Gar. Grandfather wanted to have a word privately with him. <sighs> Something about those damned memoirs, said Lady Lacklander vexedly. There was a large Jacobean chair on the landing. She let herself down into it, shuffling her astonishingly small feet out of a pair of old slippers. Colonel Carteret opened the door. Can you come, Mark? Quickly. Mark went past him into the bedroom. Lady Lacklander had risen and followed with more celerity than he would have thought possible. A tall man in evening clothes came hurrying up the stairs. Lady Lacklander was already at her husband's bedside. I'm here, Hal, she said. Nurse Kettle had appeared with a glass in her hand. Brandy, old-fashioned but good. I'll give an injection, Mark said. He turned away and found himself face to face with his father. Can I do anything? George Lacklander asked. Here's George Hal, Lady Lacklander said. We're all here with you, my dear. From behind the mask against Nurse Kettle's shoulder came a stutter. Vic, Vic, Vic. As if the pulse that was soon to run down had become semi-articulate like a clock. The vicar? Lady Lacklander asked, pressing his hand and bending over him. Do you want the vicar to come, Hal? His eyes stared up into hers. Something like a smile twitched at the corners of the gaping mouth. The head moved slightly. Mark came back with the syringe and gave the injection. After a moment, Nurse Kettle turned away. Lady Lacklander and her son and grandson drew closer to the bed. She had taken her husband's hands. What is it, Hal? What is it, my dearest? she asked. Is it the vicar? With a distinctness that astonished them, he whispered, After all, you never know.
and with his gaze still fixed on his wife, he then died. On the late afternoon, three days after his father's funeral, Sir George Lacklander sat in the study at Nun's Pardon going through the contents of the files and the desk. He was a handsome man, grizzled in a most becoming way, with grey wings at his temples and a plume above his forehead. He was fifty years old and remarkably vigorous. Sir Harold had left everything in apple pie order and his son anticipated little trouble. As he turned over the pages of his father's diaries, the butler came in to say that Colonel Cutteret had called and would like to see him. Hello, Morris, he said when the colonel came in. Glad to see you. Anything wrong? Well, yes, the colonel said. I'm sorry to bother you, George, but the truth is I'm so damn worried that I feel I've got to share my responsibility with you. The colonel took two envelopes from his pocket and laid them on the desk. Sir George saw that they were addressed in his father's writing. Read the letter first, the colonel said, indicating the smaller of the two envelopes. George gave him a wondering look. He screwed in his eyeglass, drew a single sheet of paper from the envelope, and began to read. As he did so, his mouth fell gently open and his expression grew increasingly blank. I don't understand a word of it, he said. You will, when you've looked at this. The colonel drew a thin sheaf of manuscript out of the larger envelope. George gave him a wondering look and began to read again. He was a rubicund man, but the fresh colour drained out of his face. His mouth lost its firmness and his eyes their assurance. <laughs> It's not true, he said. We've always known what happened. It was well known. I'm damn sorry, George, Colonel Carteret said. I've thought it over very carefully. He's left the decision with me, and I've decided I must publish this. I must, George. Any other course would be impossible. But, but have you thought what it will do to us? I know, believe me, George, I know how painful and distressing this will be to you all. If I could chuck it away or burn it with anything like a clear conscience, I would. He returned the envelope to the breast pocket of his coat. You're free, of course, he said, to talk this over with Lady Lacklander and Mark. I've brought a copy of his letter. The colonel produced a third envelope, laid it on the desk, and moved towards the door. And George, he said, I beg you to believe me, I am sorry. I'm deeply sorry. If I could see any other way, I'd thankfully take it. What? George Lacklander had made an inarticulate noise. He now pointed a heavy finger at the colonel. After this, he said, I needn't tell you that any question of an understanding between your girl and my boy is at an end. I didn't know, the colonel said at last, that there was any question of an understanding. If Mark has told you— Who says Mark told me? I— I— The full, rather florid voice faltered and petered out. Indeed, the colonel said. Then may I ask where you got your information? They stared at each other, and curiously the look of startled conjecture which had appeared on George Lacklander's face was reflected on the colonel's. Couldn't matter less in any case, the colonel said. Your informant, I am sure, is entirely mistaken. Goodbye. Colonel Carteret went home by the right-of-way known as the River Path. The colonel was feeling miserable. He was weighed down by his responsibility and upset by his falling out with George Lacklander, who, pompous old ass though the colonel thought him, was a lifetime friend. Worst of all, he was wretchedly disturbed by the suggestion that Rose had fallen in love with Mark— and by the inference, which he couldn't help drawing, that George Lacklander had collected this information from the colonel's wife. He came to the foot of the hill and to Bottom Bridge. The bridge divided his fishing from Mr. Danbury Finn's. He had the lower reaches and Mr. Finn the upper. The colonel crossed from Mr. Finn's side to his own, folded his arms on the stone parapet, and gazed into the sliding green world beneath. At first he stared absently, but after a moment his attention sharpened. In the left bank of the chine, near a broken-down boat shed where an old punt was moored, there was a hole. In its depths eddied and lurked a shadow among shadows.
the olden. Perhaps, the colonel thought, perhaps it would ease my mind a bit if I came down before dinner. He may stay on my side. The colonel walked slowly on and eventually turned up through the spinney into the open field below his own lawn. His wife was in her hammock, dangling a tightly encased black velvet leg, a flame-coloured sleeve and a pair of enormous earrings. The cocktail tray was ready on her iron table. How late you are, she said idly. Dinner in half an hour. What have you been up to at Nun's Pardon? I'd see George about some business. How illuminating. It was private, my dear, the colonel said miserably and went indoors. If he hadn't been so rattled and worried, he would no doubt have given some sort of warning of his approach. As it was, he crossed the heavy carpet of the hall, opened the drawing-room door, and discovered his daughter locked in Mark Lacklander's arms, from which embrace she was making but ineffectual attempts to escape. Rose and Mark behaved in the classic manner of surprised lovers. They released each other. Rose turned white and Mark red, and neither of them uttered a word. The colonel said, I'm sorry, my dear. Forgive me, and made his daughter a little bow. Rose, with a sort of agitated spontaneity, ran to him, linked her hands behind his head, and cried, It had to happen sometime, darling, didn't it? Mark said, Sir, I want her to marry me. But I won't, Rose said. I won't unless you can be happy about it. I've told him. The colonel looked from his daughter to her lover, and thought how ardent and vulnerable they seemed. Sit down, both of you he said. I've got to think what I'm going to say to you. Sit down. They obeyed him with an air of bewilderment. When you go back to Nun's Pardon, Mark, he said, you will find your father very much upset. That is because of a talk I've just had with him. It's not good news. You will find him entirely opposed to any thought of your marriage with Rose. I can't believe it. Mark said and stood up. He turned to Rose. Don't be fussed, darling. I'll go home and sort it out. The colonel took Mark by the arm and led him to the door. You won't feel very friendly towards me tomorrow, Mark, he said. Will you try to believe that the action I've been compelled to take is one that I detest taking? Compelled? Mark repeated. Yes, well, yes, of course. He stuck out the Lacklander jaw and knitted the Lacklander brows. Look here, sir. If my father welcomes our engagement, and I can't conceive of his doing anything else, will you have any objection? I'd better tell you now that no objection on either side will make the smallest difference. In that case, the colonel said, your question is academic. He held out his hand. Goodbye, Mark. By eight o'clock the evening depression had begun to settle over Commander Sice. At about five o'clock, when the sun was over the yardarm, he had a brandy and soda. This raised his spirits. With its successors, up to the third or fourth, they rose still farther. During this period he saw himself taking a job and making a howling success of it. From that emotional eminence he fell away with each succeeding dram, and it was during his decline that he usually took to archery. It had been in such a state of almost suicidal depression that he had suddenly shot an arrow over his coppice into Mr. Danbury Finn's bottom meadow and slain the mother of Thomasina Twitchett. Tonight, the onset of depression was more than usually severe. His married couple were on their annual holiday, and he had not been bothered to do anything about an evening meal. He found his arrow and limped back to the archery lawn. He no longer wanted to shoot. His gammy leg ached but he thought he'd take a turn up the drive. When he arrived at the top, it was to discover Nurse Kettle seated by the roadside in gloomy contemplation of her bicycle, which stood upside down on its saddle and handlebars. Hello, Commander, said Nurse Kettle. I've got a puncher. Evening. Really? Ball for you, Syce shot out at her. I'm going to have a shot at running repairs. Syce watched her make a pass with a lever at her tyre. Not like that, he shouted, when he could no longer endure it. And in any case, you want a bucket of water to find the puncher. She looked helplessly at him. Here, he mumbled. Give it here. 
He righted the bicycle and with a completely inaudible remark began to wheel it down his drive. Nurse Kettle followed. Commander Sice wheeled the bicycle into a gardener's shed and without the slightest attempt at any further conversation set about the removal of the tire. Nurse Kettle hitched herself up on a bench and watched him. Presently she began to talk. I am obliged to you. Epidemic in the village, odd cases all over the place, and then this happens. There! Aren't you neat-fingered? I looked at a nun's pardon this evening, she continued. Lady Lacklander's got a toe, and Dr. Mark arranged for me to do the fomentations. Commander Sice repaired the puncture and replaced the tube entire. When he had finished and made as if to stand up, he gave a sharp cry of pain, clapped his hand to the small of his back, and sank down again on his knees. Hello? Nurse Kettle ejaculated. What's all this? Bago? Commander Sice swore under his breath. Oh, oh, most frankly sorry, he groaned. I ask you to excuse me. Arr, arr. It was now that Nurse Kettle showed the quality that caused people to prefer her to grander and more up-to-date nurses. To Commander Sice's conjurations to leave him alone, followed in the extremity of his pain by furious oaths, she paid no attention. She went down on all fours beside him, enticed him and aided him towards the bench, encouraged him to use it and her own person as aids to rising, and finally had him, although almost bent double, on his feet. She helped him into the house and lowered him down on a sofa in a dismal drawing room. Down a bumps, she said. Sweating and gasping, he reclined there and glared at her. Now, what are we going to do about you, I wonder? Did I or did I not see a rug in the hall? Wait a bit. She went out and came back with a rug and covered him up, went out again and returned with a glass of water. Here's a couple of aspirin to go on with, said Nurse Kettle. He took them without looking at her. Please, don't trouble, he groaned. Thank you. Under my own steam. She gave him a look and went out again. In her absence, he attempted to get up, but was galvanized with the monstrous jab of lumbago and subsided in agony. He began to think she had gone for good when she came in with two hot water bags. At this stage, she said, heat's the ticket. Where to get those things? Borrowed them from the Carterets. My God! She laid them against his back. Dr. Mark's coming to look at you, she said. My God! He was at the Carterets, and if you ask me, there's going to be some news from that quarter before any of us are much older. To his horror, she began to take off his shoes. With a yo-heave-ho, said Nurse Kettle, out of compliment to the Navy. Like a cup of tea? she asked. No, thank you. Well, it won't be anything stronger unless the doctor says so. He reddened, caught her eye, and grinned. Come, she said, that's better. I'm really ashamed to trouble you so much. I might have said the same about my bike, mightn't I? She bustled out again and came back with Mark Lacklander. The examination was brief. Uh, if the lumbago doesn't clear up, we can do something a bit more drastic, Mark said. But in the meantime, Nurse Kettle will get you to bed. Good God! And look in again tomorrow morning. When he had gone, Nurse Kettle said cheerfully, Well, you'll have to put up with me, it seems. Half an hour later, when he was propped up in bed with a cup of hot milk and a plate of bread and butter, and the lamp within easy reach, Nurse Kettle looked down at him with her quizzical air. Well, she said, I shall now, as they say, love you and leave you. Thank you, gabbled Commander Sice nervously. Thank you, thank you, thank you. She had plodded over to the door before his voice arrested her. I am, uh, I suppose, he said. That you are familiar with Aubrey's brief lives, are you? No, she said. Who was he when he was at home? He wrote a brief life of a man called Sir Jonas Moore. It begins, Sciatica, he caught it, by boiling his buttocks. <laughs> I'm glad at least you don't propose to try that remedy. Well, cried Nurse Kettle delightedly, you are coming out of your shell to be sure. Nighty bye. During the next three days, Nurse Kettle, peddling about her duties, had occasion to notice, and she was sharp in such matters, that something untoward was going on in the district. Wherever she went, 
whether it was to attend upon Lady Lacklander's toe or upon the abscess of the gardener's child at Hammer, or upon Commander Sice's strangely persistent lumbago, she felt a kind of heightened tension in the behaviour of her patients, and also in the behaviour of young Dr. Mark Lacklander. Rose Carteret, when she encountered her in the garden, was white and jumpy. The colonel looked strained, and Mrs. Carteret singularly excited. Kettle, Lady Lacklander said on Wednesday, wincing a little as she endured the approach of a fermentation to her toe. Tell me, is there any gossip in the village about my grandson? Romantic gossip? A bit, Nurse Kettle said, and after a pause added, It'd be lovely, wouldn't it? She's a sweet girl, and an heiress into the bargain. Oof! You go past Hammer on your way home, don't you? Nurse Kettle said she did. I've written a note to Colonel Carteret. Drop it there like a good creature, will you? Nurse Kettle said she would, and fetched it from Lady Lacklander's writing desk. It's a pity, Lady Lacklander muttered, as Nurse Kettle was about to leave her. It's a pity poor George is such an ass. She considered that George gave only too clear a demonstration of being an ass when she caught a glimpse of him on the following evening. He was playing a round of golf with Mrs. Carteret. George had fallen into a muddled, excited dotage upon Kitty Carteret. She told him repeatedly how chivalrous he was, and so cast a glow of knight-errantry over impulses that are not usually seen in that light. She allowed him only the most meagre rewards, doling out the lesser stimulants of courtship in positively homeopathic doses. Thus, on the nun's pardon golf course, he was allowed to watch, criticize, and correct her swing. Lady Lacklander, tramping down river path in the cool of the evening with a footman in attendance to carry her sketching impedimenta and her shooting stick, observed her son and his pupil, as it were, in pantomime on the second tee. The two figures disappeared over the crest of the hill, and Lady Lacklander plodded heavily on in great distress of mind. Because of her ulcerated toe, she wore a pair of her late husband's shooting boots. She and the footman reached Bottom Bridge, turned left, and came to a halt before a group of alders, and the prospect of a bend in the stream. The footman set up her easel, filled her water jar at the stream, placed her camp stool, and put her shooting stick beside it. When she fell back from her work in order to observe it as a whole, Lady Lacklander was in the habit of supporting her bulk upon the shooting stick. The footman left her. She would reappear in her own time at Nun's Pardon and change for dinner at nine o'clock. The footman would return and collect her impedimenta. She fixed her spectacles on her nose, directed at her subject the sort of glance Nurse Kettle often bestowed on a recalcitrant patient, and set to work, massive and purposeful, before her easel. It was at six-thirty that she established herself there, in the meadow on the left bank of the chine, not far below Bottom Bridge. At seven, Mr. Danbury Finn, having assembled his paraphernalia for fishing, set off down Watts Hill. He did not continue to Bottom Bridge, but turned left and made for the upper reaches of the Chine. At seven, Mark Lacklander, having looked in on a patient in the village, set off on foot along Watts Lane. He carried his case of instruments, as he wished to lance the abscess of the gardener's child at Hammer, and his racket and shoes as he proposed to play tennis with Rose Carteret. He also hoped to have an extremely serious talk with her father. At seven, Nurse Kettle, having delivered Lady Lacklander's note at Hammer, turned in at Commander Sice's drive and freewheeled to his front door. At seven, Sir George Lacklander, finding himself favourably situated in a sheltered position behind a group of trees, embraced Mrs. Carteret with determination, fervour, and an ulterior motive. At Hammer... Rose and her father sat in his study and gazed at each other in dismay. When did Mark tell you? Colonel Carteret asked. On that same night. He went to Nun's Pardon and his father told him and then he came back here and told me. Daddy, you do understand, don't you, that theoretically Mark is absolutely on your side and I agree too absolutely other things being equal. Ah, said the Colonel. But they're not, darling. Rose cried out. They're nothing like equal. In terms of human happiness, they're all cockeyed. Mark says his grandmother so desperately worried that with all this coming on top of Sir Harold's death and everything, she may crack up altogether. Rose went to the window and looked down. 
She's down there somewhere, she said, sketching in Bottom Meadow. She only sketches when she's fussed. She sent me a chit. She wants me to go and talk to her at eight o'clock, and I suppose she'll have done a sketch and hopes to feel less fussed. Damned inconvenient hour, but there you are. And of course, Rose added, Mark's papa, he's cutting up most awfully rough and... Rose caught back her breath, her lips trembled, and her eyes filled with tears. She launched herself into her father's arms and burst into a flood of tears. My poor baby, murmured the agitated and sentimental colonel. My poor baby. He dabbed at her eyes with his own handkerchief, kissed her, and put her aside. Nothing to be gained by any further delay. I'll go now. He went to his desk, unlocked a drawer, and took out an envelope. Then he went to call on Mr. Octavius Danbury Finn. Lady Lacklander consulted the diamond-encrusted watch which was pinned to her tremendous bosom and discovered that it was now seven o'clock. She rose from her stool, tramped some distance away to the crest of a hillock, seated herself on her shooting stick and contemplated her work through a lorgnette tricked out with diamonds. The shooting stick sank beneath her in the soft meadowland so that the disc, which was designed to check its descent, was itself embedded to the depth of several inches. When Lady Lacklander returned to her easel, she merely abandoned her shooting stick, which remained in a vertical position, and from a distance looked a little like a giant fungoid growth. Sticking up above intervening hillocks and rushes, it was observed over the top of his glasses by the long-sighted Mr. Finn when, accompanied by Thomasina Twitchett, he came nearer to Bottom Bridge. Keeping on the right bank, he began to cast his fly in a somewhat mannered but adroit fashion over the waters most often frequented by the olden. Lady Lacklander, whose ears were as sharp as his, heard the whir of his reel, and remaining invisible was perfectly able to deduce the identity and movements of the angler. At the same time, far above them on Watts Hill, Colonel Carteret, finding nobody but seven cats at home at Jacob's cottage, walked round the house and looking down into the little valley at once spotted both Lady Lacklander and Mr. Finn, like figures in Nurse Kettle's imaginary map, the one squatting on her camp stool, the other in slow motion near Bottom Bridge. I've time to speak to him before I see her, thought the colonel, but I'll leave it here in case we don't meet. He posted his long envelope in Mr. Finn's front door, and then greatly troubled in spirit, he made for the river path, and went down into the valley, the old spaniel Skip walking at his heels. Nurse Kettle, looking through the drawing-room window at Uplands, caught sight of the colonel before he disappeared beyond Commander Sice's spinney. She administered a final tattoo with the edges of her muscular hands on Commander Sice's lumbar muscles, and bustled away to wash her hands. When she returned, Sice was sitting on the edge of his improvised bed. He wore slacks, a shirt, a scarf, and a dressing gown. I hope you will give me the pleasure of joining me for a drink before you go. They had their drinks, looking at each other with an air of comradeship. Commander Sice got out an album of photographs taken when he was on the active list in the Navy. Nurse Kettle adored photographs, and was genuinely interested in a long sequence of naval vessels, odd groups of officers, and views of seaports. Presently she turned a page and discovered quite a dashing watercolour of a corvette and then an illustrated menu with lively little caricatures in the margin. These she greatly admired, and observing a terrified and defiant expression on the face of her host, ejaculated, You never did these yourself. You did? Well, aren't you the clever one? Without answering, he produced a small portfolio which he silently thrust at her. It contained many more sketches. Although Nurse Kettle knew nothing about pictures, she did, she maintained, know what she liked and she liked these very much indeed. They were direct statements of facts, and she awarded them direct statements of approval, and was about to shut the portfolio when a sketch that had faced the wrong way round caught her attention. She turned it over. It was of a woman lying on a chaise long, smoking a cigarette in a jade holder. Why, Nurse Kettle ejaculated, why, that's Mrs. Carteret, Sy said very rapidly. Party, metaphories, surely, forgotten all about it. That would be before they were married, wouldn't it? 
Nurse Kettle remarked with perfect simplicity. She shut the portfolio, said, You know, I believe you could make my picture map of Swevenings. And told him of her great desire for one. When she got up and collected her belongings, he too rose, but with an ejaculation of distress. See? I haven't made a job of you yet, she remarked. Same time tomorrow suit you? Admirably, he said. Thank you, thank you, thank you. He gave her one of his rare, painful smiles, and watched her as she walked down the path towards his spinney. It was now a quarter to nine. Nurse Kettle had left her bicycle in the village where she was spending the evening with the Women's Institute. She therefore took the river path and followed a rough path along the right bank of the chine, past a group of alders and another of willows. As sometimes happens when we are solitary, she had the sensation of being observed, but she was not a fanciful woman and soon dismissed this feeling. It's turned much cooler, she thought. A cry of mourning, intolerably loud, rose from beyond the willows and hung on the night air. A thrush whirred out of the thicket close to her face, and the cry broke and wavered again. It was the howl of a dog. She pushed through the thicket into an opening by the river, and found the body of Colonel Carteret, with his spaniel Skip beside it, mourning him. Nurse Kettle was acquainted with death. She did not need Skip's lament to tell her that the curled figure resting its head on a turf of river grass was dead. She knelt beside it, and pushed her hand under the tweed jacket and silk shirt. Cooling, she thought. A tweed hat with fisherman's flies in the band lay over the face, she lifted it and remained quite still with it suspended in her hand. The colonel's temple had been broken as if his head had come under a waxworker's hammer. The spaniel threw back his head and howled again. He's been murdered, thought Nurse Kettle. She could see not far from the colonel's hand the glint of a trout scale in the grass and of a knife blade nearby. His rod was laid out on the lip of the bank less than a pace from where he lay. I'll find the doctor, she thought. She patted Skip, made her way out of the willow grove, and presently came into the open grounds of Nun's Pardon. The footman answered the front door. Is the doctor at home? He came in about an hour ago, miss. I want to see him, it's urgent. The family's in the library, miss. I'll ask don't bother, said Nurse Kettle, or yes, ascertain if you like, but I'll be hard on your heels. He crossed the great hall and opened the library door. Nurse Kettle, without waiting to be summoned, walked quickly into the library. The three Lacklanders had turned in their chairs. George and Mark got up. Mark looked sharply at her and came quickly towards her. Lady Lacklander said, Kettle, what has happened to you? Nurse Kettle said, Good evening, Lady Lacklander. Good evening, Sir George. She put her hands behind her back and looked full at Mark. May I speak to you, sir? She said. There's been an accident. All right, nurse, Mark said. To whom? To Colonel Carteret, sir. The expression of inquiry seemed to freeze on their faces. It was as if they retired behind newly assumed masks. What sort of accident? Mark asked. He pushed a chair forward for Nurse Kettle, and she took it thankfully. Her knees, she discovered, were wobbling. Now then, out with it, said Lady Lacklander. He's dead, isn't he, Kettle? Yes, Lady Lacklander. He's been murdered, said Nurse Kettle. In the drawing-room at Hammer there was an incongruous company assembled. Kitty Carteret, Mark Lacklander, and Nurse Kettle waited there while Lady Lacklander sat with Rose in the Colonel's study. She had arrived first at Hammer, having been driven round in her great car, while Mark and Nurse Kettle waited in the valley, and George rang up the police station at Chining. George had remembered he was a justice of the peace, and was believed to be in telephonic conference with his brethren of the bench so it had fallen to Lady Lacklander to break the news to Kitty, whom she had found wearing her black velvet tights and flame-coloured top in the drawing-room. Presently Kitty broke into a harsh, strangulated sobbing, twisting her fingers together and turning her head aside. She walked about the room, still Lady Lacklander noticed swaying her hips. Presently she fetched up by a grog tray on a small table and shakily poured herself a drink. But a sensible idea, Lady Lacklander said as the neck of the decanter chattered against the glass. Kitty awkwardly offered her a drink, which she declined with perfect equanimity. Her manner, she thought to herself, 
is really too dreadful. What shall I do if George marries her? It was at this juncture that Nurse Kettle and Mark had appeared outside the French windows. Lady Lackland had let them in. Sergeant Oliphant's there, Mark murmured. They're going to ring Scotland Yard. Does Rose... Not yet. She's out in the garden somewhere. Mark went across to Kitty and spoke to her with a quiet authority that his grandmother instantly approved. She noticed how Kitty steadied under it, how Mark, without fussing, got her into a chair. A light and charming voice sang in the hall, Come away, come away, death. And Mark turned sharply. I'll go, his grandmother said, and I'll fetch you when she asks for you. With a swifter movement than either her size or her age would have seemed to allow, she had gone. Kitty Carteret was quieter, but still caught her breath now and again in a harsh sob. <laughs> Can't believe it. We saw him down there fishing. And then she suddenly demanded, Where's George? Nurse Kettle saw Mark compress his lips. At that moment, George himself walked in and the party became even less happily assorted. My dear Kitty, said Sir George in a special voice, I'm so terribly, terribly sorry. What can one say? What can one do? Kitty's distress began perceptibly to take on a more becoming guise. She looked into his eyes and said, How terribly good of you to come. Mark was about to retire to the terrace when the door opened and his grandmother looked in. Mark, she said. He went quickly into the hall. In the study, Lady Lacklander said, and in a moment he was there with Rose, sobbing bitterly in his arms. You need pay no attention to me, Lady Lacklander said. I am about to telephone New Scotland Yard. Your father tells me they have been called in, and I propose to send for Helena Allen's boy. Central? I want New Scotland Yard, London. Mark had drawn Rose to a chair and was kneeling beside her, gently wiping away her tears. Hello, Lady Lacklander said. New Scotland Yard? This is Hermione, Lady Lacklander speaking. I wish to speak to Mr. Roderick Allen. Allen and Fox had worked late, tidying up the last phase of a tedious case of embezzlement. At twelve minutes to ten they had finished. Alain shut the file with a slap of his hand. Dreary fellow, he said. Hope they give him the maximum. Damn good riddance. Come back with me and have a drink, Brer Fox. I'm a grass widower and hating it. Troy and Ricky are in the country. What do you say? Fox drew his hand across the lower part of his face. Well now, Mr. Alain, that sounds very pleasant, he said. I say yes and thank you. Good. Alain looked round the familiar walls of the chief inspector's room at New Scotland Yard. There are occasions, he said, when one suddenly sees one's natural habitat as if for the first time. It is a terrifying sensation. Come on, let's go while the going's good. They were halfway to the door when the telephone rang. Fox said, Ah, oh, hell, without any particular animosity, and went back to answer it. Chief inspector's room, he said heavily. Well... Yes, he's here, just. He listened for a moment, gazing blandly at his superior. Say I'm dead, Alain suggested moodily. Fox laid his great palm over the receiver. They make out it's a Lady Lacklander on call from somewhere called Swevenings, he said. Lady Lacklander? Good Lord, that's old Sir Harold Lacklander's widow. Chief Inspector Alain will take the call, Fox said, and held out the receiver. Alain sat on his desk and announced himself into the receiver. Indeed, the voice rejoined. Hermione Lackland is speaking. I won't waste time reminding you about myself. You're Helena Alain's boy, and I want an assurance from you. A friend of mine has just been murdered, the voice continued, and I hear the local police are calling in your people. I would greatly prefer you, personally, to take charge of the whole thing. That can be arranged, I imagine. Alain, controlling his astonishment, said... I'm afraid only if the assistant commissioner happens to give me the job. A second telephone began to ring. Fox answered it and in a moment held up a warning hand. Central officer, orders for swavenings, homicide, blistering apes. Us? Us, said Fox stolidly. Alain spoke into his own receiver. Lady Lacklander, I am taking this case, it appears. 
Glad to hear it, said Lady Lacklander. I suggest you look pretty sharp about it. Au revoir, she added with unexpected modishness and rang off. Fox, in the meantime, had noted down instructions. It's a Colonel Carteret, he said. We go to a place called Chining in Barfordshire, where the local sergeant will meet us. Everything's laid on down below. Alain had already collected his hat, coat, and professional case. Fox followed his example. They went out together through the never-sleeping corridors. A car waited for them with Detective Sergeants Bailey and Thompson and their gear already on board. As they drove out of the yard, Big Ben struck ten. That's a remarkable woman, Fox, Alain said. She's got a brain like a turbine and a body like a ton. Her husband was one of my great white chiefs in the Foreign Service. Solemn chap. Just missed being brilliant. Before the war, the old boy was chargé de fer at Zlonitsa. The special branch got involved for a time, I remember. There was a very nasty bit of leakage. A decoded message followed by the suicide of the chap concerned. For a long time they drove on in silence, broken at long intervals by the desultory conversation of old friends. We're running into a summer storm, Alain said presently. Giant drops appeared on the windscreen and were followed in seconds by a blinding downpour. Mm, nice setup for field work, Fox grumbled. It may be local, although, no, by gum, we're nearly there. The air smelt fresher when they got out. Alain led the way into a typical county police station and was greeted by a tall, sandy-haired sergeant. Chief Inspector Alain, sir, Sergeant Oliphant, very glad to see you, sir. With that short of chaps in the country, we don't know which way to turn if anything of this nature crops up. I've left my one PC in charge of the body, and that reduces my staff to me. Shall we move off, Mr. Alain? Alain and Fox accompanied the sergeant in his car while Bailey and Thompson and the yard driver followed their lead. On the way, Sergeant Oliphant gave a report. He's lying on a patch of shingles, screened in by a half-circle of willows, and cut off on the open side by the stream. He's lying on his right side, kind of curled up, as if he'd been bowled over from a kneeling position, like. His hat was over his face. Nurse Kettle moved it when she found him, and Dr. Latlander moved it again when he examined the wound, which is in the left temple. A dirty great puncher, with what the doctor calls extensive fractures all around it. Notice anything at all out of the way? Alain asked. Oliphant made a complicated snorting noise. <laughs> out of the way? Tell me now, sir, are you a fly fisherman? Only fair to middling to worse. Why? Now, listen, Sergeant Oliphant said, quite abandoning his official position. There's a dirty great fish in this chinier. Pounds if he's an ounce he is, old and cunning he is, wary and sullen and that lordly in his lurkins and slink as he'd break your heart. Sometimes he'll rise like a monster and snap. He's took it, though that's only three times. Once being the deceased doing, a matter of a fortnight ago, which he left his cast in his jaws, he being a mighty fighter, and once the late squire Sir Harold Latlander, he lost him through being, as the man himself frankly admitted, overzealous in the playing of him. Now, said the sergeant, now for the last and final cast, hooked, played and landed by the poor colonel, sir, and lying there by his dead body, or I can't tell a five-pound trout from a stickleback. Well, if he had to die, he couldn't have had a more glorious end. The colonel, I mean, Mr. Alley, not the old un, <laughs> said Sergeant Oliphant. They pulled up at a spot opposite the boy and donkey. A figure in a mackintosh and tweed hat stood in the lighted doorway. The chief constable, sir, said Oliphant, Sir James Punston. He said he'd drive over and meet you. Alain crossed the road and introduced himself. The chief constable was a weather-beaten, tough-looking man who had been a chief commissioner of police in India. Thought I'd better come over, Sir James said, and take a look at this show. Damn bad show it is. As they slid and squelched down the muddy hillside, he gave Alain an account of the Carteret family and their neighbours. They crossed the bridge and turned left on the rough path. Alain's shoes filled with water, and water poured off the brim of his hat. Hell of a thing to happen, this bloody rain, said the chief constable. Ruin the terrain. That's Mr. Danbury Finn's preserve above the bridge. Mr. Danbury Finn, Alain said sharply. Mr. Octavius Danbury Finn, to give you the complete wax. The Danbury isn't insisted upon. He's the local eccentric... Somewhere close at hand, a dog howled dismally, and a deep voice apostrophized it. Ah, stow it, will you?
a light bobbed up ahead of them. Here we are, Sir James said. That you, Gripper? Yes, sir, said the deep voice. The Macintosh cape of a uniformed constable shone in the torchlight. Dog's still at it, seemingly, said the sergeant. A torch flashed on Skip, tied by a handkerchief to a willow branch. Hello, old fellow, Alain said, pushing through the thicket. His torchlight darted about in the rain and settled almost at once on a glistening mound. We got some ground sheets down and covered him, the sergeant said, when it looked like rain. Good. I think before we go any nearer, we'll get photographs. Come through, Bailey. Do the best you can with all the detail you can get in case it washes out before morning. By Jove, though, I believe it's lifting. They all listened. The thicket was loud with the sound of dripping foliage, but the heavy drumming of rain had stopped. When Bailey had taken his last flash photograph, Alain stooped over the head and shone his torch full on the wound. Sharp instrument, said Fox. Yes, Alain said. Yes, a great puncher, certainly. But could a sharp instrument do all that, Brer Fox? His torchlight moved away from the face and found a silver glint on the grass. And this is the olden, he murmured. The chief constable and Sergeant Oliphant both broke into excited sounds of confirmation. The light moved to the hands, lying close together. One of them was clenched about a wisp of green. Cut grass, Alain said. He was going to wrap his trout in it. There's his knife and there's the creel beside him. What we reckon, sir, said the sergeant in agreement. Cover everything up again, sergeant, and set a watch till morning. How deep, Alain asked, is the stream just here? About five foot, said Sergeant Oliphant. Really? And he lies on his right side, roughly parallel with the stream and facing it, not more than two feet from the brink, and the wounds in the left temple. I take it he was squatting on his heels within two feet of the brink and just about to bed his catch down in the grass. Now, if, as the heel marks near his feet seem to indicate, he keeled straight over into the position the body still holds, one of two things must have happened, wouldn't you say, Br'er Fox? Either, Fox said stolidly, he was coshed by a left-handed person standing behind him, or by a right-handed person standing in front of him, and at least three feet away which would place the assailant, said Alain, about twelve inches out on the surface of the stream. The chief constable said, I gather there's a cry of possible witnesses waiting for you at Hammer. That's Carteret's house up here on Watts Hill. If you'll forgive me, Alain, I won't go up with you. Serve no useful purpose. Uh, by the way, I've told them at the Boy and Donkey that you'll probably want beds for what's left of the night. Good night. He was gone before Alain could thank him. With the sergeant as guide, Alain and Fox prepared to set out for Hammer. Alain had succeeded in persuading the spaniel Skip to accept them, and after one or two false starts and whimperings, he followed at their heels. Oliphant, who was in the lead, suddenly uttered a violent oath. God, Oliphant said. I thought someone was looking at me. God, do you see that? His wavering torchlight flickered on wet willow leaves. A pair of luminous discs stared out at them from the level of a short man's eyes. Touches of surrealism, Alain muttered in Bottom Meadow. He advanced his own torch, and they saw a pair of spectacles caught up in a broken twig. We'll pluck this fruit with grateful care, he said, and gathered the spectacles into his handkerchief. The moon now shone, turning the bridge and the inky shadow it cast over the broken-down boatshed and punt into a subject for a wood engraving. They climbed the river path up Watts Hill. Skip began to whine and to wag his tail. In a moment the cause of his excitement came into view, a large tabby cat sitting on the path in the bright moonlight washing her whiskers. Thomasina Twitchit, for it was she, rolled on her back at Alain's feet and trilled beguilement. Alain stooped down and picked her up. She kneaded his chest and advanced her nose towards his. My God, woman, Alain said, you've been eating fish. Though he was unaware of it at the time, this was an immensely significant discovery. They emerged in full view of Hammer Farmhouse, with its row of French windows lit behind their curtains. Skip gave a bark and darted ahead. One of the curtains was pulled open and Mark Lacklander came through to the terrace, followed by Rose. Miss Carteret, Alain said. We are from the CID. My name is Alain. Will you come in? Rose said. She led the way into the drawing-room, where Alain found an out-of-drawing conversation piece established.
Lady Lacklander, a vast black bulk, completely filled an armchair. Kitty Carteret was extended on a sofa with one black velvet leg dangling, a cigarette in her holder, and a glass in her hand. Between the two oddly assorted women, poised on the hearth rug with a whiskey and soda looking exquisitely uncomfortable and good-looking, was Sir George Lacklander. And at a remove, in a small chair, perfectly at her ease, sat Nurse Kettle. Hello, said Lady Lacklander. You're Roderick Allen, aren't you? We haven't met since you left the Foreign Service, and that's not yesterday nor the day before that. How's your mamma? Very well, considering, Allen said, taking a hand like a pincushion in his. Considering what? Her age? She's five years my junior, and there's nothing but fat in this with me. Kitty, this is Roderick Allen, Mrs. Carteret, my son George. Aye, uh, George intervened coldly. And over there is Miss Kettle, our district nurse. Good evening, Lady Lacklander continued, looking at Fox. Good evening, my lady, said Fox placidly. Inspector Fox, Alain said. Now, what do you propose to do with us all? Take your time, she added kindly. Alain turned to Kitty Carteret. I'm sorry, he said, to come so hard on the heels of what must have been an appalling shock. I'm afraid that in these cases police inquiries are not the easiest ordeals to put up with. If I may, Mrs. Carteret, I'll begin by asking, do we know of anybody who is near Colonel Carteret within, let us say, two hours of the time? I believe it was five minutes to nine when you, Miss Kettle, found him. I was, said Lady Lacklander. I made an appointment with him for eight, which he kept twenty minutes early. Our meeting took place on the riverbank opposite the Willow Grove, where I understand he was found. That's a starting point, at least. Does anyone know anything about Colonel Carteret's movements after this meeting, which lasted, um, how long do you think, Lady Lacklander? About ten minutes. I packed up my things and left them to be collected and went home. I'd been sketching, Kitty said. I didn't see him, but I must have been somewhere near him, I suppose, when I came back from the golf course. I got home at five past eight, I remember. The golf course? At Nun's Pardon, George Lacklander said. Mrs. Carteret and I played a round of golf there this evening. I see. You came home by the bottom bridge, Mrs. Carteret. Yes, the river path. On the far side, wouldn't you overlook the willow grove? Yes, I suppose you would. As a matter of fact, I was looking, actually, at the upper reaches to see. She glanced at George Lacklander. Well, to see if I could spot Mr. Finn, she said. In the silence that followed, all three Lacklanders made slight movements that were instantly checked. Mr. Danbury Finn, Alain said. Yes. Poaching, George Lacklander ejaculated. We saw him from the second tee. He was on his own ground on the right bank above the bridge, casting above the bridge and letting the stream carry his cast under the bridge and into Carteret's waters. Most blaggardly thing I ever saw. Of course, Alain said. You were sketching, Lady Lacklander, weren't you? Whereabouts? In a hollow about the length of this room, below the bridge, on the left bank. Near a clump of alders. You're a sharpish, observant fellow, it appears. Exactly there. I couldn't see Mr. Finn poaching, but somebody else could and did. None other, said Lady Lacklander, than poor Morris Carteret himself. He saw it in the devil of a row they had over it, I may tell you. Morris caught Ocky red-handed, having just landed the Olden. They didn't see me. Lady Lacklander went on, because I was down in my hollow on the other bank. Ocky bawled out that Morris could have his so-and-so fish, and Morris said he wouldn't be seen dead with it. A look of absolute horror appeared for one second in Lady Lacklander's eyes. She hurried on. There was a thump, as if someone had thrown something wet and heavy on the ground, and on that note they parted. Morris came fuming over the hillock and saw me. Ocky, as far as I know, stormed back up the hill to Jacob's cottage. Had Colonel Carteret got the fish in his hands then? Not he. He left it there on the bridge. I saw it when I went home. For all I know, it's still lying there on the bridge. It's lying by Colonel Carteret, Alain said. And the question seems to be, doesn't it, who put it there? This time the silence was long and completely blank. Alain addressed Lady Lacklander. I think you said you left your painting gear to be collected, didn't you? I did. Who collected it, please? One of the servants. William the footman, probably. No, Mark said. No, Gar, I did. You, his grandmother said. What were you doing? And stopped short.
Mark said rapidly that after making a professional call in the village, he had gone in to play tennis at Hammer, and had stayed there until about ten minutes past eight. He had returned home by the river path, and as he approached Bottom Bridge, had seen his grandmother's shooting stick, stool, and painting gear in a deserted group on a hillock. He carried them back to Nun's Pardon. Alain asked him if he had noticed a large trout lying on Bottom Bridge. Mark said that he hadn't done so. Mrs. Carteret, Alain said, you must have crossed Bottom Bridge a few minutes after Lady Lackland had gone home, mustn't you? Did you see the fabulous trout lying on Bottom Bridge? Not a sign of it, I'm afraid. So that between about ten to eight and ten past eight the trout was removed by somebody and subsequently left in the willow grove. It was at this moment that Kitty Carteret screamed. She was staring at something beyond and behind Alain. They all turned, but found only an uncovered French window. There's someone out there, Kitty whispered. It's probably Sergeant Oliphant, Alain said. We left him outside, Fox. Fox was already on his way when the figure of a man appeared moving uncertainly. Fox opened the French window. Pray forgive an unwarrantable intrusion, said Mr. Danbury Finn. I am in quest of a fish. Mr. Finn squinted at Fox and then beyond him at the company in the drawing room. I fear I have called it an inconvenient moment, he said. I had hoped to see Colonel Carteret. Did you say, sir, Alain asked, that you were looking for a fish? Mr. Finn said, Forgive me, I don't think I have the pleasure. We are police officers, Alain said. Colonel Carteret has been murdered. You are Mr. Octavius Danbury, Finn, I think, aren't you? But how perfectly terrible, said Mr. Finn. My dear Mrs. Carteret, my dear Miss Rose, I am appalled, appalled. Alain said, I should like you to tell me about the fish you were looking for. The fish? The fish, my dear sir, is or was a magnificent trout, a Piscine emperor, and I, let me tell you, I caught him. What, Alain asked, happened to your catch? Mr. Finn began to speak very quickly indeed. Flushed with triumph, I resolved to try the upper reaches of the chine. I therefore laid my captive to rest on the upper approach to Bottom Bridge. When I returned much later, I cannot tell you how much later, for I did not carry a watch, but much, much later, I went to the exact spot where my prince of Piscines should have rested and... He made a wide gesture. Gone! Vanished! I returned home a bitterly chagrined man. And there you remained, it seems, for about four hours. It's now five past one in the morning. Why at such an hour are you paying this visit, Mr. Finn? Why? Mr. Finn exclaimed, spreading his unsteady hands. My dear sir, rendered almost suicidal by the loss of this Homeric catch, I was unable to contemplate my couch with any prospect of repose. I attempted to read, to listen to the wireless. I sought the relief of fresh air and took a turn down the river path from whence I observed lights behind these windows. Mr. Finn, Alain said, you normally wear spectacles, I think, don't you? Only for reading, he said. Lady Lacklander suddenly clapped her hands. So there we are, she said. George, I should like you to take me home. She looked straight into Alain's eyes. Do you propose to let me go home? Alain raised an eyebrow. I shall feel a good deal safer, he said, with you there than here, Lady Lacklander. Take me to my car. Alain hastened to open the door and followed her to the main entrance. Outside this, a vast elderly car waited. Now tell me, she said after she had heaved herself in, tell me, not as a policeman to an octogenarian dowager, but as a man of discretion to one of your mother's oldest friends, what do you think? of Ocky Finn's behaviour just now. Alain said, Octogenarian dowagers, even if they are my mother's oldest friends, shouldn't lure me out of doors at night and make improper suggestions. Ah, she said, so you're not going to respond. Tell me, did Mr. Finn have a son called Ludovic? Ludovic Danbury Finn? He watched her face harden. I wouldn't mention the boy if I were you. He was in the foreign service and blotted his copybook, as I dare say you know. Do you mind telling me what you and Colonel Carteret talked about? We talked about Oki poaching, and about a domestic matter that is for the moment private and can have no bearing whatever on Morris's death. <laughs>
Can you remember exactly what Mr. Finn and Colonel Carteret said to each other when they had their row? She looked hard at him. Not word for word. They had a row over the fish. Did they talk about anything else? Lady Lacklander said. No. Very coolly, indeed. Oki Finn is no murderer. Is he not? Alain said. Well, that's something to know, isn't it? Good night. He shut the door. The light in the car went out. As he turned back to the house, Alain met George Lacklander. It struck him that George was remarkably ill at ease in his company. Simply for the record, I shall have to put this sort of question to everybody who was in Colonel Carteret's landscape last evening. You and Mrs. Carteret began your round of golf, I think you said, at seven. I didn't notice the exact time, George said in a hurry. Mrs. Carteret says she arrived here at about five past eight. Perhaps you played golf roughly for an hour. How many holes? We didn't go round the course. Mrs. Carteret is learning. We spent the time practicing some of her shots, George said haughtily. Ah, yes, and you parted company at about ten to eight. Where? At the top of the river path, and now, if you'll excuse me, I really must drive my mamma home. Yes, I think we may let you go now. Afraid I shall have to ask you to stay in Swevenings for the time being. Damn nuisance, I know, but there you are. If they will turn on homicide in your bottom meadow. Good night to you. He circumnavigated George and returned to the drawing room where he addressed himself to Kitty Carteret. If I may, he said, I should like to have a very short talk with Miss Kettle. Is there perhaps another room we may use, a study, perhaps? Mrs. Carteret hesitated, but Rose said, Yes, of course, I'll show you. Fox had gone to the French window and had made a majestical signal to the sergeant, who now came into the drawing room. You all know Sergeant Oliphant, of course, Alain said. He will be in charge of the local arrangements. Mr. Finn, I will ask you to repeat the substance of your account to Sergeant Oliphant, who will take it down and get you to sign it if it is correct. Mr. Finn blinked at him. And now, Miss Carteret, may we indeed use the study? Rose led the way across the hall into the room where eight hours ago she had talked to her father about her love for Mark. Alain and Fox followed. He seems to be here, you know. This was his place more than anywhere else. She faltered. Alain asked quietly, Was he worried about anything? Yes, he was indeed. But it's private and even if it wasn't, it couldn't possibly be of any use. When did you see him last? This evening. I mean, last evening, don't I? Oh, he, um, he went out soon after seven. Where did he go? She hesitated and then said, I believe to call on Mr. Finn. Do you know why? I think it had something to do with, with the publishing business. The publishing business? She pushed a strand of hair back and pressed the heels of her hands against her eyes. I don't know who could do such a thing to him, she said. Her voice was drained of all its colour. Her eyes, fatigued by tears, looked for a moment at a table where a tray of casts were set out. I always tied the flies. We made up a fly he nearly always fished with. I tied one this afternoon. The door opened and Mark Lacklander came in looking angry. Ah, there you are he said. He walked straight over and put his fingers on her wrist. You're going to bed at once. I've asked Nurse Kettle to make a hot drink for you. She's waiting for you now, he glared at Alain. Miss Carteret is my patient, he said, and those are my instructions. They sound altogether admirable, Alain rejoined. I wonder if we may see Nurse Kettle as soon as she is free, and you a little later, if you please, Dr. Lacklander. Certainly, sir, Mark said stiffly, and taking Rose's arm, led her out of the room. Nurse Kettle sat tidily on an armless chair. She had just given Alain a neat account of her finding of Colonel Carteret's body. That's all, really, she said. Except that I had a jolly strong feeling I was being watched. You get it on night duty in a ward, a patient lying awake and staring at you. You always know before you look. I suppose, Alain said, you know all these people pretty well, don't you, Miss Kettle? I always think in country districts the Queen's nurses are rather like liaison officers. Nurse Kettle looked pleased. Well, now, she said, we do get to know people. Of course, our duties take us mostly to the ordinary folk, although with the present shortage we find ourselves doing quite a lot for the other sort. They pay the full fee and that helps the association. So, as long as it's not depriving the ones who can't afford it, we take the odd upper-class case. Like me and Lady Lacklander's toe, for instance.' 
And then again I night-nursed the old gentleman. With him when he died, actually. Well, so was the family. And the colonel, too, as it happens. Colonel Carteret. That's right. Or, wait a moment, I'm telling stories. The colonel didn't come back into the room. He stayed on the landing with the papers. The papers? The old gentleman's memoirs, they were. The colonel was to see about publishing them. The old gentleman was very troubled about them. He couldn't be content to say goodbye and give up until he'd seen the colonel. Well, no sooner had he handed them over than he took much worse and the colonel gave the alarm. We all went in. I gave brandy. Dr. Mark gave an injection, but it was all over in a minute. Vic, he said. Vic, Vic. Mm, that was all. Alain repeated. Vic. And they were silent for so long that Nurse Kettle had begun to say, Well, if that's all I can do, when he interrupted her, I was going to ask you, he said, who lives in the house between this one and Mr. Finn's? Nurse Kettle smiled. At Uplands, she said. Commander Sice, he's another of my victims, she added, and unaccountably turned rather pink. D down with a bad go of Bago, poor chap. Miss Kettle, you liked Colonel Carteret, didn't you? It was clear from your manner, I thought, that you liked him very much indeed. Well, I did. He was one of the nicest and gentlest souls. Devoted father, never said an unkind word about anybody. Not even about Mr. Finn? Now look here, she said. Mr. Finn's eccentric, but there's no arm in him. He's had this tragedy in his life, poor man, and in my opinion he's never been the same since it happened. Before the war it was. His only son did away with himself. Shocking thing. Wasn't the son in the foreign service? That's right, Ludovic. He was in some foreign place when it happened. Broke his mother's heart, they always say, but she was a cardiac anyway, poor thing. Mr. Finn never really got over it. I remember hearing about it, said Alain, vaguely. Wasn't he one of Sir Harold Lacklander's young men? That's right. So the Swivelling's families tend to gravitate towards foreign parts. Nurse Kettle said they certainly seemed to do so. Apart from the young Vicky Danbury Finn getting a job in Sir Harold's embassy, there was Commander Sice, whose ship had been based at Singapore, and the Colonel himself, who had been attached to a number of missions in the Far East, including one at Singapore. Nurse Kettle added that she believed he had met his second wife there. Really? Alain said with no display of interest. At the time when Sice was out there, do you mean? It was the merest shot in the dark, but it found its mark. Nurse Kettle became pink and said with excessive brightness that she believed that the commander and the second Mrs. C. had known each other out in the East. She added, with an air of cramming herself over some emotional hurdle, that she had seen a very pretty drawing that the commander had made of Mrs. Carteret. You'd pick it out for her at once, she said. Did you know the first Mrs. Carteret? Well, not to say no. They were only married eighteen months when she died giving birth to Miss Rose. She stood up. If there's nothing more, she said, I'll just have a word with the doctor and see if there's anything I can do for Miss Rose or her stepmother before they settle down. Alain and Fox contemplated each other with the absent-minded habit of long association. Before we see Dr. Lacklander, Alain said, let's take stock, Brer Fox. What are you thinking about? Fox dragged his palm across his jaw. A secluded district, he said. There seems to have been quite a bit of traffic in the Valley of the Chine. Doesn't there? Down this hill, over the bridge, up the other hill, and t'other way round, none of them meeting except the murdered man and old Finn at half-past seven, and the murdered man and Lady Lacklander ten minutes later. Otherwise it seems to have been a series of near misses on all hands. Let's have a word with young Lacklander, shall we? Fetch him in, Foxkin, and while you're there, see how Mr. Finn's getting on with his statement to the sergeant. While Fox was away, Alain looked more closely at Colonel Carteret's study. He was interested to find a sizable book with the title The Scaly Breed by Maurice Carteret. It was a work on the habits and characteristics of freshwater trout. Alain's gaze travelled over the surface of the desk and ran down the front. He tried the drawers. The top pair were unlocked and contained only writing paper and envelopes. The centre pairs on each side were locked. The bottom left-hand drawer pulled out. It was empty. His attention sharpened. He had stooped down to look more closely at it when he heard Fox's voice in the hall. He pushed the drawer to and stood away from the desk. Mark Lacklander came in with Fox. Alain said, I shan't keep you for long. Indeed, I have only asked you to come in to clear up one small point and to help us with another. The first question is this. When you went home at a quarter past eight last evening, did you hear a dog howling in Bottom Meadow?
No, Mark said. No, I'm sure I didn't, but I remembered meeting a tabby cat, one of Oki Finn's menagerie, I imagine, on an evening stroll. Where was she? This side of the bridge, said Mark, looking bored. Right. I believe, Alain said, that Sir Harold's autobiography is to be published, Mark said. Did Finn tell you that? Now, why in the wide world, Alain asked, should Mr. Octavius Finn tell me? There was a long silence broken by Mark. I'm sorry, sir, Mark said. I must decline absolutely to answer any more questions. You're perfectly within your rights. Is there any objection now to my driving to the dispensary? No objection in the world, he said. Good morning to you, Dr. Lacklander, Mark repeated. I'm sorry. And with a troubled look at both of them, went out of the room. Brer Fox, Alain said, we shall snatch a couple of hours of sleep at the boy and donkey, but before we do so, will you bend your fancy upon the bottom drawer on the left-hand side of Colonel Carteret's desk? Fox did as he was bidden. Forced, he said. Recent. Chipped. Quite so. Job's been done unhandily by an amateur. We'll seal this room, and tomorrow we'll put in the camera and dabs, boys. In the morning, Foxkin, if you're a good boy, you shall be told the sad and cautionary story of Master Ludovic Finn. Fox was duly acquainted with the story of Ludovic Finn over ham and eggs in the parlour of the boy and donkey shortly after dawn. I know about young Finn, Alain said, because his debacle occurred when I was doing a spell in the special branch in 1937. At that time, the late Sir Harold Blacklander was our ambassador at Zlonitsa, and Master Danbury Finn was his personal secretary. Young Finn arrived with his alma mater's milk wet on his lips. He made some very dubious Zlonitsa chums, among whom was a German agent of a particularly persuasive sort. He became completely sold on the Nazi formula. And on the night after a crucial cable had come through for his chief, he presented his Slonitzer chums with the whole story. Lacklander gave him bottled hell, and he went away and blew his brains out. A brilliant but unbalanced boy. His mother died a few months afterwards, I believe. Sad, said Mr. Fox. Would you say, Mr. Alley, now that this Mr. Finn Sr. was slightly round the bend? His behaviour in the watches of last night was certainly oddish. He was a frightened man, Fox, if ever I saw one. What do you think? Mm, the opportunity was there, Fox said, going straight to the first principle of police investigation. It was. And by the way, Bailey's done his dab drill. The spectacles are Mr. Danbury Finn's. It's not conclusive. He might have lost them down there earlier in the day, but there's one item that emerged last night which I don't think we can afford to disregard, Fox. I take it, Fox said, that you're wondering if there's a full account of young Finn's offence in the memoirs. They link the Carterets with the Lacklanders, and they may well link Mr. Finn with both. They provide so far the only connecting theme in this group of apparently very conventional people. There's a car pulling up. It'll be Dr. Curtis. Let's return to the bottom field and to the question of opportunity and evidence. By Midsummer Morning Light Colonel Carteret looked incongruous in the willow grove. Dr. Curtis completed a superficial examination and stood up. That's all I want here, Alain, he said. I've given Oliphant the contents of the pockets. As for general appearances, rigour is well established and is, I think, about to go off. I understand you found out that he was alive up to 8.15 and that he was found dead at nine. Well, I won't get any closer in time than that. The injuries? Tentatively, two weapons. There's a clean puncture with deep penetration. There's circular indentation with the puncture at its centre, and there's been a heavy blow over the same area. And no prints, Alain said. There's prints from the people that found him, clear enough, and there's his own heel marks. You can see how he was, clear enough. Yes, Alain said, squatting on a bit of soft ground facing the stream. He'd cut several handfuls of grass with his knife and was about to wrap up that trout. He turned towards the stream. Look here, Fox. He nodded at a group of tall daisies and pointed to three leggy stems taller than their fellows from which the blooms had been cut away. You can move him, he said, but don't tramp over the ground more than you can help. And by the way, Fox, have you noticed that inside the willow grove, near the point of entry, there's a flattened patch of grass and several broken and bent twigs? Remember that Nurse Kettle thought she was observed? Go ahead, Oliphant. Sergeant Oliphant and P.C. Gripper came forward with a stretcher. They put it down some distance from the body which they now raised. As they did so, a daisy head dropped from the coat. Pick it up tenderly, 
Alain said as he did so, and treat it with care. We must find the other two if we can. This murderer said it with flowers. Alain found a second daisy on the bank below the point where Colonel Carteret's head had lain. The third, he said, may have gone downstream, but we'll see. He now looked at Colonel Carteret's rod. Alain lifted the cast and sniffed at it. He hooked a fish yesterday, he said. There's a flake of flesh on the barb. Where, then, is this trout he caught down this ruined ground? He cautiously lifted the olden and examined the patch of stones where the great fish had lain. Look, there's a sharp, flinty bit of stone with a flap of fish skin on it. Now, let's see. He turned the great trout over and searched its clamminess for a sign of a missing piece of skin and could find none. Well, it's pretty clear that he made a catch of his own and that the fish itself was subsequently removed and the old one put in its place. Now, take a look upstream towards the bridge, Brer Fox. Go round about, because we'll still keep the immediate vicinity unmucked up. And then come out here. Fox joined Alain on the lower bank of the little bay at the point where it jutted farthest out into the stream. They looked up the chine past the willow grove, which hid the near end of the bridge to the far end which was just visible about forty feet away, with the old punt moored in the hole beneath it. Alain said, Charming, isn't it? Like a lead pencil vignette in a Victorian album. Stay where you are, Vox, for a moment, will you? Get down on your sinful old hunkers and bow your head over an imaginary fish. Don't look up and don't move till I tell you. Ah, what's all this, I do wonder? Mr. Fox speculated and squatted calmly at the water's edge with his great hands between his feet. Alain skirted round the crucial area and disappeared into the willow grove. It was quite a shock to Dr. Curtis, Bailey, Thompson, Oliphant, and Gripper when round the upstream point of the willow grove bay the old punt came sliding with Alain standing in it, a wilted daisy head in his hand. The punt was carried transversely by the current away from the far bank and across the main stream into the little Willow Grove harbour. It glided silently to rest, its square prow fitting neatly into the scar in the downstream bank. At the same time its bottom grated on the gravel spit, and it became motionless. I suppose, Alain said, you heard that, didn't you? Fox looked up. I heard it, he said, but I saw and heard nothing until then. Carteret must have heard it too, Alain said, which accounts, I fancy, for the daisies. Bro Fox, do you think we know who done it? Fox said, If I take your meaning, Mr. Alain, I think you think you do. Things to be borne in mind, Alain said, still speaking from the punt. Point one, I found the daisy head in the prow. Point two, this old crock has got a spare mooring line about thirty feet long. It's still made fast at the other end, and I've only got to haul myself back. I imagine the arrangement is for the convenience of Lady Lacklander, who, judging by splashes of old watercolour, occasionally paints from the punt. There is also, by the way, a pale yellow giant hairpin in close association with two or three cigarette butts, some with lipstick and some not. Been there for some considerable time, I should say, so that's another story. Sir G, Fox ruminated, and the girlfriend? Trust you, Alain said, for clamping down on the sex story. To return, point three, remember that the punt journey would be hidden from the dwellers on Watts Hill. Only this end of the bridge and the small area between it and the willow grove is visible to them. I suggest that the killer saw Carteret from the other bank, squatting over his catch. I suggest the killer, familiar with the punt, slipped into it, let go the painter, and was carried across the stream and into this bay. I suggest that this person was well enough acquainted with the colonel for him merely to look up when he heard the punt grate on the gravel and not rise. Have a look at the area between the punt and the place where the body lay. It would be possible to step from the punt onto that patch of stones, and you would then be standing close to the position of Colonel Carteret's head. You would leave little or no trace of your presence, and there are several pieces of cut grass in the bottom of the punt, and they smell of fish. Do they now? said Fox appreciatively. I'm leaving orders, Oliphant, for a number one search for the missing fish, and meet me, Alain said to Fox, on the other bank. I've something to show you. He gathered up the long tow rope, pulled himself easily into the contra current, and so back across the stretch of water to the boat shed. When Fox, having come round by the bridge, joined him there, he was shaking his head. Oliphant and his boys have been over the ground like a herd of rhinos, he said, still. Have a look here, Fox. They stood looking down at a scarcely perceptible hole in the turf.
The grass nearby showed traces of pressure. If you examine that hole closely, Alain said, you'll see it's surrounded by a circular indentation. Yes, Fox said after a long pause. Yes, by God, so it is. Same as the injury, by God. It's the mark of the second weapon, Alain said. It's the mark of a shooting stick, Brer Fox. Attractive house, Alain said as they emerged from the home coppice into full view of Nun's pardon. We'll have to go cautiously here, Brer Fox, by gum we shall, he added as Lady Lacklander came out of the house with half a dozen dogs at her heels. She's wearing men's boots, Fox observed. That may be because of her ulcerated toe. Ah, to be sure. Lord love her, she's got a shooting stick on her arm. So she has. Hell's boots, she's going to sit on it. Lady Lacklander had halted, opened her shooting stick, and, with alarming empiricism, let herself down on it. With her weight, Alain said crossly, she'll bloody well bury it. Come on. As soon as they were within hailing distance, Lady Lacklander shouted, Good morning, Coyle. Have you been up all night? Not that you look like them, I say. Alain said, We're sorry to begin plaguing you so early, but we're in a bit of a jam. I, uh, I want to reconstruct the crucial bit of the landscape as it was after you left it. Will you lend us your shooting stick and your sketching gear for an hour or so? We'll take the greatest care of them. Well, I don't know what you're up to, she said, and I suppose I may as well make up my mind that I won't find out. Here you are. She heaved herself up and with a single powerful wrench tore the shooting stick from its bondage. The sketching gear is up at the house. Come and get it. Alain thanked her, and they all three went up to the house. George Lacklander was in the hall. Well, George, his mother said, and bestowed a peculiar smirk upon him. I don't suppose they'll let me out on bail, but no doubt you'll be allowed to visit me. Really, Mamma? Roderick is demanding my sketching gear on what appears to me to be a sadly trumped-up excuse. He has not yet, however, administered what I understand to be the usual warning. Really, Mamma? George repeated with a miserable titter. Come along, Rory, Lady Lacklander continued and led Alain into a cloakroom where umbrellas, an assortment of galoshes, boots and shoes and a variety of rackets and clubs were assembled. Help yourself. Thanks so much for helping us, Alain said. He and Fox were aware of her great bulk motionless on the steps as they made their way back to the home coppice. And I don't mind betting, Alain said, that from the rear we look as self-conscious as a brace of snowballs in hell. When they were out of sight in the trees, they examined their booty. Alain laid the shooting stick on a bank and squatted beside it. The disc, he said, screws on above the ferrule, which obviously hasn't been disengaged for weeks, all to the good. If it's the weapon, there's a good chance of a blood trace under the collar. We must let Curtis have this at once. Now, let's have a look at her kit. He unbuckled the straps and peered inside, sniffing. He drew a length of stained cotton rag out of the kit. It was blotched with patches of watery colour and with one dark brownish-reddish stain. Alain looked up at his colleague. Smell, Fox, he said. Fox sniffed stetterously. Fish, he said. After they handed over Lady Lacklander's property to Sergeant Oliphant with an explanatory note for Dr. Curtis and instructions to search the valley for the missing trout, they then climbed the river path to Uplands. They passed through the Hammer Farm spinney and entered that of Commander Sice. Here they encountered a small notice nailed to a tree. Beware of archery. Look at that, Fox said, and we've forgotten our green tights. As they emerged from Commander Sice's spinney into his garden, they heard a twang followed by a peculiar whining sound and the took of a penetrating blow. What the hell's that? Fox exclaimed. Sounded like the flight of an arrow. Which is not surprising, Alain rejoined, as that is what it was. He nodded at a tree not far from where they stood, and there was embedded an arrow prettily flighted in red. Alain pulled out the arrow and looked closely at it. Deadly if they hit the right spot. Come on. They emerged from the spinney to discover Commander Sice himself some fifty yards away, bow in hand. As they plodded up the hill, he looked anywhere but at them, and when finally Alain introduced himself and Fox, he shied away from them like an unbroken colt. We are, Alain explained, police officers. Good Lord! I suppose you've heard of last night's tragedy. What tragedy? Colonel Carteret has been murdered. Great grief! When? About nine o'clock, we think. Who found him? The district nurse, Nurse Kettle. 
Commander Sice turned scarlet. I say, come in, Wolfhill. No kidnapping out here, what? They followed him into his desolate drawing room and noted the improvised bed now tidily made up and a table set out with an orderly array of drawing materials and watercolours. Alain said that as a matter of routine the police were calling upon Carteret's neighbours. We hoped that by talking to those of the colonel's neighbours who were anywhere near— I wasn't, nowhere near. Then uh, you know where he was found? Of course I do. You said nine o'clock. Miss, uh, the, 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 the lady who told me found her left here at five to nine. I saw her go down into the valley. She found him at nine. He must have been in the perishing valley, mustn't he? I watched her go down. From where? From the window. You were on your feet, then, not completely prostrate with lumbago. Commander Sice began to look wretchedly uncomfortable. I, I struggled up, don't you know, he said. And this morning you've quite recovered? Mm, comes and goes. Very tricky, said Alain. I understand that you've known Colonel Carteret a great many years. Off and on, neighbours, damn nice fellow. Exactly, and I believe that when Carteret was in the Far East you ran up against him at Hong Kong, was it? Singapore. Oh, yes. The reason why I'm asking you is we are wondering if it can possibly be a back kick from his work out in the East. Wouldn't know. Did you see much of them out there? Them? The Carterets. Commander Sice glared at Alain. He wasn't married, he said. Then? So you didn't meet the second Mrs. Carteret until you came back here, I suppose? Commander Sice thrust his hands into his pockets and walked over to the window. I had met her, yes, he mumbled, out there. Before they married? Yes. Did you bring them together? Alain asked lightly, and he saw the muscles in the back of Sice's neck stiffen under the reddened skin. I introduced them as it happens, Sice said loudly without turning his head. That's always rather amusing. Oh, I find it so, being, Alain said, looking fixedly at Fox, an incorrigible matchmaker. Good God, nothing like that, Sice shouted. Last thing I intended, good God, no! He spoke with extraordinary vehemence, and seemed to be moved equally by astonishment, shame, and indignation. Alain noticed the unsteady hands, moist skin and patchy colour, and the bewildered, unhappy look in the very blue eyes. Alcoholic, poor devil, he thought. So you bring about this first meeting with Miss— I don't know Mrs. Carteret's maiden name, Commander Sice mumbled unhappily. De Vere. There was a marked silence. Fox cleared his throat. Ah, yes, Alain said. Would you have thought, Fox asked, as he and Alain made their way through Mr. Finn's coppice to Jacob's cottage, that the present Mrs. Carteret was born into the purple, Mr. Alain? I wouldn't have said so, Brer Fox. I should think she must find life in Swetherings pretty dim. Here's Mr. Finn Spinney, and here, I think, is our girlfriend of last night. Mrs. Thomasina Twitchett was, in fact, taking a stroll. Good morning, my dear, said Alain. They climbed up through Mr. Finn's spinney and finally emerged on the lawn before Jacob's cottage. Though if that's a cottage, Fox observed, Buck House is a bungalow. Mr. Finn came out of his house accompanied by an escort of cats and Mrs. Twitchett's three fat kittens. No more, he was saying in his curious alto voice. All gone! Go and catch my sea, you lazy lot of fires! He set down the empty dish he had been carrying. Some object fell from his breast pocket, and he replaced it in a hurry. Then he saw Alain and Fox. "'Good morning,' Mr. Finn fluted thickly. "'To what beneficent constabular breeze do I owe this enchanting surprise?' "'Detectives armed, I perceive,' he added, with a malevolent glance at Commander Sice's arrow, which Alain had retained by the simple expedient of absent-mindedly walking away with it. Good morning, Mr. Finn, Alain said. I have been renewing my acquaintance with your charming cat. He sat on his heels beside Mrs. Twitchett, who gently kicked away one of her two greedy kittens. Her fur's in wonderful condition for a nursing mother, he said, stroking it. Do you give her anything special to eat? Mr. Finn began to talk with the sickening extravagance of the feline fanatic. A balanced diet, he explained, of her own choosing. Fissy on Mondays and Fridays, Steaky on Tuesdays, Livy on Wednesdays, Cook Bun on Thursdays and Sundays. Fish only twice a week, Alain mused. You don't occasionally catch her dinner for her in the chine.
When I am successful, Mr. Finn said, we share. Did you? Alain asked, fatuously addressing himself to the cat. Did you have fresh fissy for your supper last night, my angel? No, said Mr. Finn. You made no other catch then besides the fabulous Olden. No. May we talk? Mr. Finn, silent for once, led the way through a side door and down a passage into a sizable library. The colonel's study had been pleasant, civilized, and not lacking in feminine graces. Mr. Finn's library was disorderly, dirty, and neglected. It was on Mr. Finn's shelves that Alain noticed an unexpected link with the colonel, for here among a collection of books on angling he saw again the scaly breed by Morris Carteret. But what interested Alain perhaps more than all these items was a state of chaos that was to be observed on and near a very nice serpentine-fronted bureau. "'Glass of sherry?' asked Mr. Finn. "'No, I'm afraid this is a duty call.' "'Indeed. How I wish I could be of some help. I have spent a perfectly wretched night fretting and speculating, you know. A murderer in the Vale. We are so very respectable in Swetherings. Not a ripple, one would have thought, on the surface of the Chine.' "'Would one not?' Alain asked. "'What about the Battle of the Olden?' Mr. Finn fluttered his fingers. Now, Lizzie, he said with rather breathless airiness, and all the rest of it. But really, the car was most exasperating as an angler, a monument of integrity in every other respect, I dare say, but as a fly fisherman, I am sorry to say there were some hideous lapses. It is an ethical paradox that so noble a sport should occasionally be wedded to such lamentable malpractices. Such, Alain suggested, as casting under a bridge into your neighbour's preserves. I will defend my action before the judgment seat, and the ghost of the sublime Walton himself will thunder in my defence. It was entirely permissible. Did you and the colonel, Alain said, speak of anything else but this, uh, this ethical paradox? Mr. Finn glared at him, opened his mouth, and shut it again. You, of course, have your information from Lady Gargantua, the mammoth Chatelaine, the great, repeat, great lady of Nun's Pardon said Mr. Finn, and then surprisingly turned pink. His gaze, oddly fixed, was directed past Alain's elbow to some object behind him. Did she divulge the nature of my father conversation with the colonel? No. Then neither, said Mr. Finn, shall I? Very well, Alain said, and turned away with an air of finality. He'd been standing with his back to a desk, presiding over an incredibly heaped-up litter were two photographs in tarnished silver frames. One was of a lady. The other was of a young man bearing a strong resemblance to her and inscribed in a flowing hand, Ludovic. It was at this photograph that Mr. Finn had been staring. Alain said, looking at the photograph, This is your son, sir, isn't it? Mr. Finn, in a voice that was quite unlike his usual emphatic alto, said, My son, Ludovic. We have discovered that Sir Harold Lacklander died with the name Vic on his lips and full of concern about the publication of his own memoirs, which he had entrusted to Colonel Carteret. We know that your son was Sir Harold's secretary during a crucial period of his administration in Slonitzer, and that Sir Harold could hardly avoid mention of the tragedy of your son's death if he was to write anything like a definitive record of his own career. I wonder if the discussion that Lady Lacklander overheard was about some such matter. Mr. Finn beat his pudgy hands together once. "'If Lady L. does not care to tell you,' he announced, "'then neither for the time being do I.' "'I wonder,' Alain said, "'if you'd mind showing us your fishing gear.' Mr. Finn stared at him. "'It's not here,' he said. "'I'll get it. Fox will help you.' Mr. Finn looked as if he didn't much relish this offer, but appeared to think better of refusing it. He and Fox went out together. Alain moved over to the book-lined wall on his left and took down Morris Carteret's work on the scaly breed. He riffled through the pages. The book appeared to be a series of short essays on the behaviour and eccentricities of freshwater fish. It was illustrated rather charmingly with marginal drawings. Alain turned back to the title page and found that they were by Geoffrey Sice. His eye fell on a page heading. No two alike, and with astonishment he saw what at first he took to be two magnified fingerprints showing the essential dissimilarities. When, however, he looked more closely, he found written underneath, Microphotographs, figure one, scale of brown trout, six years, figure two, scale of trout, four years, one and a half pounds. 
It is not perhaps generally known, the colonel had written, that the scales of no two trout are alike, I mean microscopically alike in the sense that no two sets of fingerprints correspond. It is amusing to reflect that in the watery world a rogue trout may leave incriminating evidence behind him in the form of what might be called scales of justice. Alain replaced the book and turned to the desk with its indescribable litter. Having inspected the surface, he disclosed a letter addressed to Octavius Finn, Esquire, in the beautiful and unmistakable handwriting of Colonel Carteret. Alain had just had time enough to discover that it contained about thirty pages of typescript marked on the outside seven when he heard Fox's voice on the stairs. He turned away. Here are my toys, Mr. Finn said shortly. He was evidently one of those anglers who cannot resist the call of the illustrated catalogue and the lure of the gadget. His creel, his gaff, his net, his case of flies, and his superb rod were supplemented by every conceivable toy, all of them expensive, freshly cleaned, and in wonderful order. Alan picked up a short, heavily leaded rod. What do you call the thing? he asked. It's called a priest. Don't know why. Perhaps because of its valedictory function. Alain laid it on the desk and placed Commander Sice's arrow beside it. I really must return this arrow to Commander Sice, Alain said absently. I found it in the spinney embedded in a tree trunk. He might have touched off a high explosive. The colour flooded angrily into Mr. Finn's face, and he began to shout of the infamies of Commander Sice and his archery. The death of Thomasina Twitchett's mother at the hands of Commander Sice was furiously recalled. Sice, Mr. Finn said, would drink himself into a sagittal fury and fire arrows off madly into the landscape. Only last night, Mr. Finn continued, when he himself was returning from the chine, the commander's bow was twanging away, and Mr. Finn had actually heard the took of an arrow in a tree trunk dangerously near to himself. The time was a quarter past eight. He remembered hearing his clock chime. I think you must be mistaken, Alain put it mildly. Nurse Kettle tells us that last evening, Commander Sice was completely incapacitated by an acute attack of lumbago. Mr. Finn shouted out a rude and derisive word. I see, Alain said. Do you mind if we take possession of your fishing gear for a short time? Part of a routine check, you know, and also I'm afraid the shoes and suit that you wore on your fishing expedition. Oh, fat lot of use, Mr. Finn muttered. If I said no... Mr. Finn's angling garments were exceedingly grubby and smelt quite strongly of fish. Alain saw, with satisfaction, a slimy deposit on the right leg of a pair of old-fashioned knickerbockers. We won't keep you any longer, Alain said. Unless, by any chance, you would care to give us a true account of your ramblings in the watches of the night.